Welcome to our talk, Formatting for the Masses. We will wait for you, Lorenzo. No, take a seat. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, what's wrong on that slide? There's a line break missing at the beginning. That was not by intention, but we didn't say that the algorithm is perfect. <clears throat> okay, first of all, um, Sebastian? That's me. Uh, I'm a language engineer at Itemis, and I'm not a data scientist, so please deal with me <laughs> later on. <laughs> yeah, no. this guy is me. Um, I'm Holger, working for Itemis in that XTEX area. And today we would like to talk about formatting for the masses. So it's about formatting. Who does not know what formatting means? Hopefully nobody. So it's about bringing your code into shape so it, that it looks beautiful. What means beautiful? Beautiful means bring it in a shape that somebody can actually read it. And that means by um, applying formatting, you have line breaks and all that stuff and your code is better readable than this one. This is valid, the parser will not really complain, but nobody can read it. Actually, who, who knows what that kind of stuff here is? Yeah, Carsten? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's X grammar. But it looks better when it, it's formatted in this way. So it's about spaces, it's about line breaks, it's about indentation, and there is a difference between indentation and alignment. So alignment means that we have here two things that are aligned in the same uh, way and we don't care about the or at the beginning. So that's a difference between alignment and indentation. But you can claim there are already formatter out there. <coughs> and actually that's true. Who knows J indent? Nobody, you know. <laughs> that's really fancy stuff. We have found that on the web and we were a little bit irritated that it's so cheap. So it's a formatter for 100 bucks for just one user and there is a calculator that uh, finds the best price for you as a company to own your special Java code formatter. It's really awesome. Yeah, just kidding. Um, there are a lot of formatters out there, especially for GPLs. So what's the point? The point is that formatting is a matter of taste. So your colleague may want to do things completely different than you. Normally you have a default formatting configuration for your project, but um, especially in the AdMerks framework, in the um, AdMerks formatting, there we have a special thing here. We have that line break Somebody likes that. Um, we say natural formatting looks different, but it's a matter of taste. So you might know JDT. And JDT comes, yeah, you don't. <laughs> JDT comes with a formatter, and JDT comes with thousands of options. And that is because formatting is a matter of taste. And you can serialize that all that preferences and carry around with your project and share it with your colleagues, that's absolutely fine. But what if there is no option for your special case? Mm, the JDT guys have an option for that. You can switch off the formatter um, by a special tag, add formatter off and add formatter on. Yes, and it works, okay. So, but what's the point? When everything is doable with JDT, what do we do if we don't have a formatter? So, especially in the case when you're thinking about domain-specific languages, mm, writing a formatter is a hard thing. So, um, Bob Nistrom said, it's the hardest program I've ever written to write a code formatter. Um, yeah, we, we know that. In Xtex, we have an API for that. To be honest, two different APIs. One is just about concentrating on the grammar itself, and the other one that is new is concentrating on the grammar, and um, you can access the AST during formatting, so that depending on the state of your model, you can make decisions how to format things. And that's kind of cool, but still code that you have to write. It's not simple, and it's not trivial. So, and even when you have a rich API to create a formatter, you end up in something that is not customizable for your user of your language. So you will do the very same thing that the JDT guys did. You will introduce options and all that stuff, but 
for x text, it's true, it's not coming for free. You have to do that on your own, and that's a lot of work. Nobody wants to do that. What would it be if in formatter uh, would work by example? That means you throw a bunch of already consistent formatted files on a machine, and that machine guesses how to format the rest. That would be cool, and that is what we want to talk about today. So we stumbled upon um, a paper from Terence Barr, who is actually the guy behind Antel Air, and in Ixtex we use Antel Air, so we know that guy. And he really has a clue how to do that. We stumbled upon a paper um, that introduces CodeBuff. CodeBuff is a project, you will find that on GitHub, and we will come to that back in the demo. But before that, I would like to hand it over to Sebastian, who will talk about the really fancy stuff, not the stuff that I said. Yeah. So let's try to fix this here. Without getting blinded. Cool idea to hand over the mic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, code buff a tool that claims to help us with formatting of arbitrary languages. Um, it's based on a fundamental assumption. Um, that is, when you, when you are the author of a document and you know in advance what kind of content you are going to write into this document, then you can produce the optimal formatting when you format each and every token step by step from left to right. So in other words, the assumption is that the code buff will format your document from the first token to the last token, left to right, without uh, considering any existing white space that is right of the cursor. So everything that's left to the cursor is considered to be already formatted because everything was already formatted. Everything to the right, uh, which is white space, will be ignored. And by applying this algorithm, the assumption is that you will get a nicely formatted document. So that is step one. Step two is um, that there exists a function that allows to compute um, what kind of white space you have to introduce for a token. And uh, what I want to explain now is how this function looks like and uh, what's behind this. So who of you is kind of familiar with machine learning? Mm, okay, as I said, please bear with me, I'm not a data scientist. But what machine learning in a very simplified way basically does is it uh, takes an input vector of um, numbers and applies a function to that vector and produce an output vector, a result. And the key here is that you personally, as a developer, don't need to think about this function because the machine will somehow figure out uh, what's to be done with this vector. So that is a super simplified idea how machine learning could work. And uh, what CodePath does, it's basically describing how this vector is supposed to look like for a token to produce white space. Um, for this talk, uh, Holger did a nice experiment. Uh, we married the XTEX framework and the CodePath project. So um, he will show that in a demo in a few minutes. But in the meantime, what I want to explain is how this works in general to produce formatting for a sequence of tokens. So our example language here is the XTEX grammar itself, the XTEX grammar language where we have um, a header and some um, e-package generation clauses and some production rules. And if we look at one of these production rules, it's basically just some snippet out of this document. Um, what we have to do to produce a formatted snippet is, first of all, we have to create a sequence of tokens. So the first operation that's to be applied when we want to format something is we have to identify what is the real content, so we split the document into tokens. So we have package declaration as an identifier token, then a colon as a simple uh, character token, then we have something that is a string literal called package, and so on and so forth. And if we now pick some arbitrary token from here, let's say this identifier elements, then the, ch uh, the challenge is to compute the formatting for this token, which is a text change, and the text change in the end is the amount of white space that we need to put in front of the token that we are going to type. So as I said, from left to right, everything is already formatted, and at this point, 
it's mimicked. What would the developer do when he starts writing the um, identifier elements? He would put a line break and some indentation. So the formatting operation, format a token and produce a, to a text change. It can be um, split it up in uh, it can be split up in three basic operations. So we have um, some function that extracts uh, token properties. So these are the relevant aspects of a token that we need to make a decision. Then we match the token properties against some known corpus of existing token properties to produce the white space, and in the end we apply the white space. This is in general how the formatting function is uh, implemented. And what I want to do now is I want to explain the steps in some arbitrary order. So I will start with the definition of what is a white space in our scenario. We have five different kinds of white space. So there's a simple space insertion, so a, a number of spaces that we want to put there. There's a new line operation, so we want to put a new line before we continue typing. We want to indent the current token relative to another token. So indentation is always relative to something else. We want to align our token with some other token. So alignment obviously is about putting things in um, vertical, appearing like lines um, formatting. So we always need a, an anchor, which is the other token. Or we just say, there shouldn't be any space here, I do nothing. So these are the five uh, possible outcomes that in the end can be reduced to a vector of two integers. So the number of spaces and the number of new lines that we need to produce a formatted output. In our case, we have one new line and eight spaces. Makes sense so far? Yes, no, maybe? No, yes, that's good. Uh, anyway. <laughs> so we match the token properties to get um, the spaces and new lines. So what are token properties? Token properties are the features of a token, features is the terminology here, that we want to consider to compute the white space. Um, what you usually do nowadays with machine learning is um, something that's called feature engineering. So you have to identify the um, important concepts and you have to throw away the concept that will scramble your result. Um, what Adler, uh, what Terence did with CodePath is kind of manual feature engineering. It's not what you would do nowadays in all the cases, but it's a way to get towards machine learning. So he identified a certain set of um, important characteristics of a token that make up the formatting in the end. Um, as I said, you always need a kind of vector of features. So a token property is a vector with um, a certain dimension, and then we have uh, different elements that contribute to the applied formatting. First and foremost, it's the token type. So a parenthesis is formatted differently from a string literal, and a string literal is formatted differently from, uh, let's say, an identifier. Then uh, we are allowed to look to our left token and also to the right token, where the left token may also contribute its white space information because that is already available, and we uh, again have this fundamental assumption that everything to the left is properly formatted. Um, there's a concept of paired tokens. Um, most naturally, these are parentheses. But in some grammars, uh, we also have things that don't appear to be parentheses, but always appear in pairs. Like in the x text grammar, we have the colon and the semicolon for the production words. And things like angular brackets, uh, squared brackets, things like that. Um, when you pass a document, you do not only have a token, but you span, uh, you create a tree of um, production rules. So what uh, Terence also figured is that it's important where a certain token was used in the containment of, um, of production rules. So he looks at uh, the parent node types and the parents parents node type and the parents parents node and, and so on and so forth, so up to five levels. Um, it, he figured out that it's not a good idea to go even further because then you would do something that's called overfitting. Your formatting rules would only match for one given document and cannot be generalized. So, and last but not least, when you look at languages, it's in, in grammars, you always find things like lists, lists of parameters, lists of uh, operators for a function, um, lists of a binary function, um, lists of members in a class. So whenever you have something like a multiple cardinality or um, like an optional value, it's important uh, how big the list is in total, and at which element I'm uh, sitting with the current token. 
So these are um, five, or yeah, actually more than five because we cloak five different things here. Um, different features that were um, that I choose to present. In total, Terence figured that there are 21 different characteristics for a token that have to be considered, out of which 15 are relevant for the number of line breaks and out of which 11 uh, are relevant for the number of spaces. So this is what the um, function does that extracts the properties of a token. It creates a vector with uh, 21 dimensions. So now that we know how to extract token properties and that we know what we want to produce, spaces and new lines, we can train a set of input documents. What we figured for Xtext as an example is um, that unit test documents, when you create your own language, are usually nicely formatted and can just be fed into this um, uh, CodePuff project so that you have a set of corpus documents that are representative for the contents of your language and um, you create uh, for each token in all of the corpus documents, the token properties, you compute the number of spaces that have been used and the, you compute the number of new lines that have been used. So this is the baseline that you need. And what you end up with is a matrix with as many uh, columns as you have tokens in your, total, um, in your total corpus and 21 plus two lines, dimensions. Now the idea is, of course, we don't want, uh, the idea is that we want to format unknown documents. Um, so what we do with an unknown document is pretty much the same as what we did in the training. We take a token, an unknown token, and extract all the properties apart from the uh, new line and spaces, because we ignore those since we want to compute them. And then we need to match the unknown token properties or the unseen token properties to figure out how many spaces need to be inserted. So there's an operation that is to be applied for the big matrix and the extracted vector to compute the smaller vector. So that is in essence what happens. And uh, now a few more words on this function, which is the um, selection mechanism that uh, CodeBuff uses. It's the KNN algorithm, so the K nearest neighbors with a set of 10,000 uh, tokens that are in your corpus, you would usually pick 100 um, nearest neighbors to figure the result. Uh, at CodeBuff, uh, it was measured that 11 tokens are sufficient to get the best formatting in the end. So a very small set of required corpus documents is also sufficient by like transitivity. Um, so out of the uh, unknown vector with 21 dimensions, we pick the k most similar um, known vectors. Then we have um, 11 space and new line information. Out of the, uh, for these, we apply a function that is kind of, well, it's a little bit different from a plain average, but in the end, we end up with a number of spaces and new lines in our way function and then we can say this is just to be inserted before the token. And then we have, when we do this from left to right through the entire document, we have a formatted document. Questions so far? Yes? Is there any other method tried than KNN or why was the 11 uh, set of neighbors defined? Um, that's a fair question. So, uh, question was whether there was any other method that has been uh, tried in the CodeBuff project. Uh, Unfortunately, if there was something else tried, it was not documented, but it would make sense to apply other strategies to also have some applied way on the different features that have been explored. But this was like in the related work section of the paper. It's, so there's something good enough and everything else is related work or future work. Uh, one more slide, I guess. <laughs> well prepared. So out of our matrix, we choose 11 um, representative candidates, and then we apply this wave function and get the result, what I just said. Demo time, right? Cool. Let me hand this over to you without strangling. We have enough time. <laughs> <coughs> okay, demo. <coughs> Resolution is not that good here, but we will try our best. So, first of all, 
That's the web page of the CodeBuff project, and you will see some kind of documentation. Um, it's not really a documentation that you would expect because it's more or less an academic project. Um, but at the end, there is something useful because your grammar um, <laughs> has to fulfill, <laughs> sorry for that, has to fulfill some kind of requirements. So white space should go into the hidden channel of the parser same for comments, and that's the only thing you have to fulfill with your grammar. Um, CodeBuff is based on Ant Layer 4, and as Sebastian said at the beginning, we want to marry Xtext and CodeBuff. That's not feasible normally, because we're using Ant Layer 3 for good reasons. I don't want to go into details, um, but we, we have to do something to make that happen. So let's have a look at Eclipse. Um, this one here, the .g file, is something that is generated. Actually, that is a Antler 3 grammar that is generated through the generator of Xtext. And this one is polluted by a lot of extra things that uh, will help us in creating the AST, the node model, and all that stuff. But this uh, will not compile um, in combination with CodeBuff. So what we need is the clean, pure grammar that is just about the tokens. And luckily there is a function for that. Normally it's there to debug um, a grammar and we have a, a so-called fragment. A fragment is a piece of the Xtext generator that is responsible for generating a certain thing, a part of the complete infrastructure. And the parser generator is responsible for generating the grammar, and out of the grammar, the parser will get generated. And it has a special flag, the debug grammar flag, and if I set that to true, it will generate me a grammar that is clean. It's just about the grammar itself that cares about the tokens, and we can work with that. The only thing that we have to change is, um, as I said, we have to fulfill some things, and actually, that's not happening here. And we, we have to tweak the grammar a bit. Um, of course, we can write a fragment to do that in addition to the already existing fragment to get an Arndl F4 grammar. That's not really rocket science. It's not that hard. Um, to be honest, we haven't done that. Um, I have done that manually. Can you do certain details for this case? Yeah. That is rocket science indeed. <laughs> yeah. But um, to be honest, now I have to switch to IDEA because um, the integration for Antel F4 is not really good in Eclipse, sorry. So this one here is a grammar, an Antel F4 grammar. And in IDEA, you can uh, put in an example and it will show you the AST that is um, created out of that example. That's not really hot. Well, that is not what I wanted to present. I just want to show that there is an integration. And um, in and, and this special case here, um, this one is the, the CodeBuff project itself. I cloned the complete repository because I'm a lazy guy. Siri, shut up. Um, I had that in my last session as well. <laughs> okay. So here we have um, a bunch of grammars. Um, Terence worked with um, Java, as Java comes from the original author of Java, and um, then with Java 8, um, SQL, and now, in addition, Xtext. And what you have to do is you have to handle in a G4 grammar, Antle F4 grammar, and out of that you have to generate the lexer in the parser, and that is done by the parser generator of Antle F4. And then there are the corpus areas. So for each language that you have, you have to handle in a bunch of um, files that are formatted in the very same way. So you have to make sure that indentation is done the same way. I just want to show some examples. So if you zoom here in, hopefully you can see it. White space is shown. And indentation is always done through four um, white spaces. When we go back to the website of CodeBuff, you will see something useful in addition, the explanation how to use that stuff. 
Um, it's a bunch of parameters that you handle in by calling a main method of a Java class. And it's about the, um, the class that should do all that stuff. The sophisticated name is tool. Then you have to handle in the grammar itself. And it should be on the class path. Then you have to specify um, a rule that is the top rule of your grammar, so the entry rule. And then you have to handle in the uh, amount of white spaces that actually make an indentation. You have to say, what is a comment? And at the end, you have to handle in uh, a file that should get formatted. So that's everything. And we go back to IDEA. Um, so here I have um, the X text area where I can put in corpus and I tried that with um, all files that I could find inside of the XText repository. So um, Sebastian um, told you that we are experimenting with just handling in all the files that comes with the JUnit tests. So they are not well defined, but they are some kind of defined and, and precise uh, formatted. And the results were not that bad. But I would like to show something more easy. Um, Terence in CodeBuff has tried to figure out if the formatter works good. And there is one validation to do that. The name of that is leave one out. That means here is a bunch of things. In this case, we have xbase, extent, and xtext itself. And the domain model, of course, in addition. So if we have a look at that, it's formatted in the way that I would expect it to be formatted. And we have the indentation level of four. And now I can call a tool that is not on the command line, but it's still a main method. And that will bring up a um, debug window where we can see um, what example made the, um, the program apply a certain formatting rule. And I will do that in two different steps. Um, first, I will do that with something that is completely not formatted, because otherwise you will not believe me that it's possible. And it's, it's taking only three files as a corpus, as an example. And then I will try the very same with the already formatted file. And you will see that there are still things that go wrong. And, but we can see why that goes wrong. So first, I will start the code buff scope area and we will see on the left hand side it's the um, the original source and on the right hand side you will see the very same document but formatted through um, the machine learning algorithm and um, in this case it's leave one out so that means the file on the left hand side is left out from the corpus it's not um, taken to train the algorithm and on the right hand side, you see the ex example. And you will see here, um, out of the files that we have used as um, corpus, we can see which file causes the machine to do a certain rule in the formatting. It doesn't make sense in this um, example. Just wanted to show that it really formats something in a way that you would expect. And um, I can run that again with an other configuration where the file is already formatted. And there you will see that there is an error. So here on the left hand side is the well formatted document. And you will see at this special case here, um, <laughs> the resolution is not that good. So in this special case here where the feature um, of the entities are defined, I would have expected that there is um, this curly brace in the line before, like here. And when you have a look at here, you can see on line 17, predicted was a line break and then a white space, but actually it's a white space, or oh, it was expected that there is a white space, um, but actually there is a line break. And on the right hand side, out of the examples, we can see that, for example, in extent, there is a, an area that the algorithm identified as a criteria to format this stuff. Actually, it's not correct. What you would 
do normally is go back to your example, fix that, and try again, so that you have an, a, a good way to establish a, a, a good formatting, um, and at the end, hopefully, the algorithm will work in the way that you expected. So we are nearly over. What's wrong? So um, in the COPA project, you will find that uh, statistics. On, um, on the bottom, you will see the amount of corpus example files that were taken. On the left-hand side, you will see the error rate. Um, this means 5%. In the example that we have seen, it was 5% as well. So this would um, tell us that um, normally an amount of 10 example files are enough. Beyond that point, the result will not get better, but it will not get worse anyway. So you can throw a lot of files on it, but it will just take more time and doesn't really fix something. And we have another statistic. Um, where you can see that when you throw normal formatted Java code, the JDT itself, um, on the algorithm, you will see that the error rate is around 5%. But if you have a look at Guava, and Guava forces a certain formatting, the error rate goes down. And that's pretty cool. Um, so if you are um, aware that you have to handle in good examples that are formatted in the very same way, you will end up in something that is really cool. And the formatting algorithm currently isn't perfect. So um, you can download it for zero euro. It's, it's not a J intent, but it's not really production ready. So it's an academic project, um, but it would make fun to combine that really with Xtext. So far we haven't done that. I don't like to write formatters at all, so maybe that's a good step. Okay, we are over and we are in time. We are open for questions. I'm not sure I understand the, the thing about the comments. So <coughs> you have to leave the comments out, but can you then format the comments and take Java dot comments? I think the assumption is that um, format um, that comments should not get formatted. It's they should stay in the same way as before. So it would not change the contents of the comment itself, but it would put the comment at the right orientation with the, the language of the format. Exactly. But if you have an extra form like Java Talk, that might work, right? You just need the grammar. And yes. Yeah. The grammar for Java Th then that would work, yeah. 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 Without that, it doesn't make sense. But with it, why not? So it's 
uh, what, what it counts is a, it's an academic paper and he wanted to put it uh, on some conference. So what he used was a, was a measurement that would minimize the error rate even though the document is completely scrambled. So when your first decision is indent this by 20 characters, every subsequent line would be indented by 20 characters and you would say this is not proper formatting. It would still count as only one error in the entire document. Um, what this exactly means is hard to tell because when you just browse manually through the corpus documents and what the outcome is, there are a few things that are just off. And so especially in, with longer files, close to the bottom of the document, there were plenty of errors. Um, what I can imagine is that um, a different algorithm to pick the, num the, the best match and then together with that even bigger uh, number of documents for the corpus training would yield better results. But there was nothing, there was no, no section on the outcome of these experiments. So with random forest also you could train far better models as I expect than with this manual feature. Um, so yeah, for simple languages like Xtext, uh, grammars itself it's pretty good uh, when you look at the outcome. When you look at the um, TSQL examples, they're also very beautiful in the end. So on the web page there was one example that was formatted by Cobra. Do you want to see the, the yeah, page? why not? This one? So, yeah, exactly. So this was produced as the um, like canonical formatting for some bigger uh, select statement. I would say this looks quite good. But of course, if your other code base looks different, then you have a high error rate there. And so the, out the, the outcome is promising, but not yet perfect or even close to production readiness. There is a section in the paper, it's about future work. So there is something ongoing. Potentially. <laughs> Potentially. And hopefully we'll have a master thesis about that in the future, in the near future. Yeah. At ITMS. So one colleague of us will concentrate on that, hopefully. Yes. Uh, you apply this with respect to uh, bar searching again? Um, or is it based on something you have to do with this language? What it does, so the question is, uh, what does it do when it uh, wants to apply the formatting to the document? Uh, so right now the implementation will train all documents and format the one that you want to format, which is not feasible. But of course it would persist the result of the training and deserialize it. And then it would just uh, pass the document, the answer for grammar that, so in the exact case, you would just pass the grammar. Yeah, so yes, so it's just not as far as the formatting itself was pretty fast. Formatting yeah. itself is uh, less performant than the training. So the training, yeah. yeah. Because it could be interesting, um, a harder feature than just formatting is formatting when, when you press enter from the file, that you get the right indentation. Yeah. And that's something like fuzzy or maybe that yeah. could be a different thing. Uh, that would be an interesting experiment to use this. Actual plans not, but I think it's a nice experiment, and we we have to find out how much work that is, and maybe it's a challenge that our master student can um, afford. So step one would be to bring it back into a shape that it would actually be usable, and step two would be to ship a kind of default formatter as soon as you have the language and uh, try to unit tests. But Codebug is open source, Xtext is open source, maybe you are a contributor. <laughs> okay, thanks again for being here, hopefully you enjoyed it. <laughs>